بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله الذي أنزل القرآن هدى للناس وعلمناه وزكينا به وأرت النبي المعلم الحبيب الأعظم سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم ليبين لنا الآيات لأنه صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم أخلاقه قرآن فما أبين وأوضح لمعاني القرآن منه صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد المترجم القرآن بلسانه وأخلاقه الشريف وعلى وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم نوينا بدراستنا لتفسير آيات آيات القرآن مناجة الله تعالى واستخرج العلوم من القرآن وتعاذ بكلام الله تعالى وتمنعنا به وزد الإيمان وتنوير قلوبنا وشرح صدورنا وابتغاء الأجور والثواب وحسن رضا من الرحمن ودخول في أهلنا وخاصته وغفران الذنوب وشفاء في أجسادنا وقلوبنا وسلاح أهلنا وأولادنا وسلاح المسلمين ونوينا ونوينا ما نواه النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم وسلف الصالح مش نوع الانتنشنز نانينج السورة إن شاء الله الفاتحة الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه في كل لحظة أبدا على دنيا عام الله وأفضاله اللهم آتنا من لدنك رحمة وعلمنا من لدنك علما سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نوات تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير ونفع والانتفاع والفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء إلى الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى معرفة وعافية برحمةك يا رحمة رحيمين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم اللهم ألهمنا علما نفقه به وامرك ونواهيك وارزقنا فهما نعرف به كيف نجيك يا رحمة رحيمين اللهم نسألك فهم النبي وحفظ المسلم وإلهام الملكة المقربين في عافية رحم الرحيم اللهم أغنى بالعلم زينا بالحلم أكرم التقوى جميلة بعافية يا رحم الرحيم آمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم إلى استودعك ما قرأناه وما نقرأه في هذا المجر ما قبل وما بعده فاحفظه علينا حتى ترده إلينا وقت احتياجنا إليه يا رحم الرحيم اللهم أكرمنا من نور الفهم وأخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وافتح لنا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا حكمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم يا من مقاد الأمور كلها بيده وإليه يرجع الأمر كله يا فتاح يا عالم يا فتاح يا عالم يا فتاح يا عالم افتح علينا فتحا قريبا صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأخذ من لساني فقه القولي وسر لساني وهدي قلبي وفعل كذلك بأحبابي أبدا ورزقنا كمال الفتوح العارفين والفق في الدين معكم الإخذ وسرق يوكين والعافية وغنى ونسر حفظ النفع والدفاع وخير الدارين وعلوم الأولين والآخرين آمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة Right. Uh, we are on to the last part of Surah Fajr today and inshallah uh, today we will continue into Surah Al-Ghashiyah right. so, inshallah right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim so Surah Fajr right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, like, uh, again to go through a, a brief summary because it is us the last part of Surah Fajr so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins right, by taking an oath right, by the early morning right, and this early morning is a sign of hope the sign of a new day, the sign of a new life, a sign of change, right? The early morning. So when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala speaks about this early morning hope, 
right? Because in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will speak about the worst of uh, human beings, right? He will begin the, the entire surah by right? speaking about the Ad and the Thamud and Fir'aun, right? So the, the beginning of the surah has Fir'aun, the Ad and the Thamud, the worst of human beings, right? And, and, in, and in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about what is the problem with mankind, right? What is, you know, these this human beings, you know, why are they, why are they so corrupt? And at the, at, the, at the crux of the matter is basically their love of this dunya. Uh, this, is, this is the simplest, that's the, the problem. The problem is that, uh, their love of wealth, their love of dunya. That's what Rasulullah Alaihi Wasallam said. Hubbud dunya ra'sukullu khati'ah. Right, love of this world, it is the, the source head of every wrong action. Right, because you see when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes his oaths, right, from the beginning of the surah, we mentioned about the... When, when he speaks about the ten nights, right, when he speaks about the end of the night and the night departs, these are all moments in the person's life whereby he can change his life. Because the beginning of the surah speaks about the worst of human beings and the end of the surah speaks about the best of them. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan maradiyya Right, so, so you see this, this huge difference between the beginning and the end right, and, and, and the, the vows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken at the beginning of the surah right, to show that human beings, you can change right, from, the, from, from, from the worst of human beings, right, they can be the best of human beings at the end. Right, a huge uh, difference eh? and that shows right, when someone repents, right, it's just like, like, just like the dawn uh, rising upon them. Right? They are leaving the darknesses of what they were in right? and they are coming into a new life. They are coming into a new light right? and they are coming towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That's why at, in the center of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions very clearly right, what is the problem of this human being. Right? Uh, 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 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَا بَتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَّامَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا uh, And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَلَّا بَلْ لَا تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمُ وَلَا تَحَاضُونَ عَلَى طُعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ وَتَأْكُلُونَ التُّرَاسَ أَكْلَ الْلَمَّا uh, that, is the, that is the main problem. Uh, you don't honor the, 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 the orphan, you don't honor the poor, you don't help the poor, rather uh, you devour wealth. Right, the biggest problem in human beings is their obsession with wealth, their obsession with gold and silver. Right, and it's mentioned that you know when when the, when human beings invented uh, gold and silver, right, Iblis said you know there's no need for me now, right, to try and and, and make them uh, worship idols, right, because I have these, you know, Iblis, you know, I have gold and silver. This will be enough for them to distract them from their Lord, from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And Iblis is definitely, I mean, he has he's proven his point now. Right, that human beings, when it comes to money, right, they will forget uh, their creator. Right, so, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He breaks off uh, from talking about a human being and He gives, he gives a scene on a day of judgment right, whereby He says that وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًّا صَفًّا And your Lord and the angels, they will come in ranks, you know, in, 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 in rows. Right, and Jahannam will be dragged. And you mentioned that Jahannam right, is like a creature. Right, Jahannam will be dragged with 70,000 chains right, Dragging Jahannam And on every chain There will be 70,000 angels of hellfire Dragging it And Jahannam has a roar right, In the Quran Allah subhanahu wa mentions you know, About the, 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 the groan and the roar of Jan- Jahannam <laughs> There's a roar there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's, a, it's a creature in the morning right, The morning of Jahannam right, What? Groaning and moaning. Uh, basically, there, there, there is a there's a there's a roar of Jahannam that the that uh, uh, from from some of the narrations that those who hear the roar of Jahannam right you make as if they, they, their skin will crawl right. And it just like even just to hear the, the roar of Jahannam is enough as a punishment right, for on, on a person. So on that day, right, Jahannam will be dragged right uh, uh, in, uh, to presence. Right, uh, uh, Jahannam. Right, and this is the this is the line. Right, on that day, only on that day will they remember. Right, the human beings they will remember on that day. And for what point is his remembrance? And what's the point now? Right, it's not now you're supposed to remember. You're supposed to remember before this incident. Right, on that day, the, the, Allah says in the Quran, 
on that day, right, the iman of a believer does not benefit him. Right, on, on that day, those who have not benefited, those who have not believed from before, from, from in this dunya. Right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Right, uh, uh, and he stops there. And on that day, none will punish the way he will punish. Right, and none will hold to account the way he will hold to account. It will not. No, you cannot imagine the, the, the terror of that day. So here, this is where we left off. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He changes the entire tune. The entire atmosphere, the entire sense it is suddenly changed. Right? And, he's, and, and the tone becomes very gentle. Right? And very, like you would say, you know, it's full of love right? for the, to the one that he is addressing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he calls out to the nafsul mutma'inna. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan, ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan maradiyah. There are three levels here. The first level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out to the soul, calling it the nafsul mutma'inna. And this nafsul mutma'inna is the opposite, exact opposite nafs of the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began Surah Fajr with. The Ayat, the Thamud, the Fir'aun. They are the, they are the worst. They are they're on the other extreme. Like of uh, of what, what what evil human beings can uh, they, they they can they can achieve lah you know of what evil they can drop down to are right? they on the other extreme right? and they have and these people right they don't have any uh, tranquility in their souls they don't they actually do not have any tranquility in their souls right this now I was uh, from a talk right whereby one of the speakers right, was uh, presenting about why we have no peace right? and actually the answer is in the Quran <laughs> right why do we have no peace. Right, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, nafsul mutma'inna, as the soul who is in complete peace. Right? The word mutma'inna means the soul is so, is so, in so much calm and so much peace and so much serenity. Right? And nothing can perturb the soul. Right? And here right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, irji'i ila rabbiki mardiya. Here you have two meanings. The first meaning is that this, this uh, verses are revealed Right, to this, uh, to this soul at peace, on the day of judgment. That's the first meaning. On the day of judgment, or uh, at the point of death. Right. So at the point of death, the judgment. That's the first meaning. The other meaning is that the soul keeps going back to its Lord what, no, where, during his, its own lifetime. Right. So while on earth, uh, if a, if a person wants to seek happiness, tranquility, peace, serenity. Right, then it is on the person, the first thing here. Irji'i ila rabbiki Run to your Lord. Right, run back to your Lord. Right, please with him and he is pleased with you. Right, so the nafsu, I'm going to uh, explain this part. Nafsu has, has, has uh, different levels. Last week we spoke about nafsu amara bisu. Right, the nafs, the nafs that commands to evil. This nafs is a very, is a highly volatile nafs. Uh, because it's always commanding the, the body to its desires, desires, desires. Uh, and you know that for a human being, your desires, you can never satiate your desires. Ever. Rasulullah said in the hadith uh, that you know, if the son of Adam was given one mountain of gold, he would just ask for another. Right? The son of ne- that nothing will fill the mouth of the, or, the, or the, the belly of the son of Adam except the, 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 the soil from his own grave. It means he will not, he will not stop seeking you know what his nafs wants he will not stop nothing can satiate him he cannot and he will keep one thing and one thing and one thing and one thing and the only thing that will stop him is, is his own death and when he dies and he stops and then he stops seeking from this world right, so and a, a, a nafs that is like that will never reach tranquility because it's always one thing when you're always one thing you're not you're not you're not at peace you know you're not in serenity you're not you're not uh, uh calm and you're not mutmainna so the nafsul mutma'inna is a nafs that has no desire for this world whatsoever. Because this world ne- will never satiate you. Uh, Imam, Imam uh, Abdul Qadir Jalani, he said that, he said that uh, taking from this world is like drinking from an ocean and hoping to be quenched. And everyone knows that if you drink salt water, you get more thirsty. Right? So this is what devouring the world is. Right? The more you try to devour, the more hungry you get. 
Right, the more you drink uh, sea, sea water, you don't get you don't get quenched, and right, you actually get more thirsty. Right, so Moshe Rabbeinu he said that you know like, to to try to quench your thirst, right, it's like you know to to eat from his dunya or to, to to consume from his dunya, it is like drinking from the sea and hoping to be quenched. You will never be quenched, right? It's just an, a bottomless pit. It makes you more and more and more thirsty. Right, so that is the Nafsul Amara Bisu. Nafsul Amara Bisu is the one that desires this dunya. Uh, and it keeps running after it, it will never find any peace. And in our, in our modern day, this is so, it is really proven. Whereby you see people, you know, the, the rich and the famous, a lot of them, it's not just one of them or two of them, a lot of them. And there's a huge you know, percentage of them, and those who have everything, you will say, of a dunya. They have their fame, they have their money, they have their, you know, whatever, lah, their following and everything. And, but you will see one by one, these people, Right, they will turn to something to find some sort of satisfaction in life. Right, they're so they're empty. Right, they're empty. They're they're not at peace. They are they are, they're always you know in this uh, pain or whatsoever they're in. So they turn to drugs. They turn to this. They turn to that. They turn to all kinds of things that they destroy themselves in trying to find some sort of peace. Right, so this is one of the you know this is the ex- extreme of in our day. You see this kind of uh, the amara only brings people to destruction. That's all it does. The second the, the, high, the level that is higher than that last week you mentioned was Nasul Lawama. Nasul Lawama right, it is higher level, it's better, right, because it identifies when the nafs is misbehaving. It's able to identify. Right, so it identifies it and, it and it begins to blame the nafs. Right, so it's called the self blaming soul. Right, and inshallah, most of us, we are there. <laughs> Let's not be at Nasul Amara. Right, at least you know, we need to have reached Nasul Lawama. I reach there. At least you know when you when you do something that is you know against the Sharia or against the Sunnah or against or something that is macro, you should be having something you know something in your heart uh, nagging at you. Right? There should be some sort of nagging feeling. You know you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be going there. You shouldn't be saying this. You shouldn't be looking at this. You shouldn't be reading this. You shouldn't be you know there should be this nagging feeling in your heart. Right? And that is iman. Uh, that is a sign of Imam Mahadis Rabbi Rasulullah. There was a man that came to Rasulullah and he was a man and said, Ya Rasulullah, I, I have thoughts that come to my head that I am ashamed of. You know, I'm ashamed if anybody were to find out what the thoughts, these thoughts that come to my head. And, then, and, and I hate them. I hate that they come to me. And Rasulullah said to the man, That is Iman. Right? That that you feel, you know, that, that when you have these things coming to your mind, these things coming to your heart that you dislike. And you hate it that it comes to you, right? That is iman, right? That the pain, right? That means that if you like, if you if you rush through your prayer and after that you like, ah, oh, sila, <laughs> I don't know why did I do that? You know why didn't I have more focus? You know, or you or you say something to your mother right, or to your father, you know, and after that, ah, oh, should have just should have just you know controlled my tongue. <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything at all. Right? You know, that is nasulawama, nasulawama, nasul amara. Is the one that you know they will shout at their parents or they will shout at their whoever's <coughs> older than them, right? And then they will feel, oh, I have the right. And this is a amara bisu. And as lawama, they would have this nagging feeling that was not right. And that was not right. You shouldn't have done that. And it's, it's constant uh, self blame, and it's good. It's actually good to have this constant self blame, not not to bring you down into like some sort of despair, right? But it's more of to push you to be better. Right? In Islam, right, to have self blame, right, in a way whereby it improves you. Is highly recommended, right? So when if like in this in this, in our time we have people who speak against, you know, oh, you shouldn't blame yourself, you shouldn't blame yourself, you shouldn't you know uh, scold yourself inside. You should in a way whereby it pushes you to improve. Otherwise, how will you improve? Right? You should be able to identify for yourself, right? That you know what you did is not right. You should be able to identify, right? and you should be you should admit because you're human being. We're all human beings. It's okay. Uh, you to commit mistakes, uh, to make mistakes. But the whole point is you need to get better. That is Nasul Lawama. Nasul Mutma'inna is above that. Nasul Mutma'inna is a nafs that is drawn to the Sharia. Right? That means it is desirous of the Sharia. And that comes from the Hadith of Rasulullah Azza, whereby he said that uh, none of you truly believe until his nafs, right, his, his soul, right, his nafs is. In the, is desirous of what I came with. Only then have you reached perfect iman. So your iman is still not perfected until you actually reach a point whereby your 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 nafs inside of you right, actually loves the Sharia. It is drawn to the Sharia. Right? Like like whenever he prays, he wants to pray. He wants to pray some more. 
Whenever you use Quran, you want to read more Quran. Whenever it fasts, it loves to fast. Like Sayyidina Ali, he said, you know, of the things that is most beloved to him, Sayyidina Ali, eh, most beloved to him is the summer. So when he was asked why, right, he said, because the days are long. So I can fast the whole day. Right, you all, you all suka, suka buka ya cepat. <laughs> right, he likes it when the days are long and hot. <laughs> like fast from around 4 a.m. to all the way to 8 p.m., 9 p.m. <laughs> right, you know, sign Ali. That's when your nafs is so under control that you actually desire long fasting days. <laughs> long and hot fasting days. <laughs> right, our nafs is like, no. <laughs> right, and some of the, some of the ulama, right, they will say that, you know, for 20 years, the one thing that would break my heart every day is the coming of dawn. Because that would mean that my night prayer has come to an end. It means that they, they pray the whole night. Right? So their nafs is really desirous <laughs> of this. And for us, it's not, not bangun. <laughs> Do two rakats, four rakats. <laughs> right? Some rakats. We do some rakats. Right? This one, Allah, you know, it's just... Nafs, this is, you know, we are still nafs la wama, eh? I said, like, why like, why like, you, wake, you sleep so late? Why like, you wake up so late? Why like, <laughs> you know, why like, you're so, so sleepy? Why you Isha, you know, half, half-hearted <laughs> Isha? And I said, like, kasihan, gitu orang. <laughs> right. May Allah SWT help us like, in, our, in our nafs. The nafs is a creature, Imam Wazari says, that needs to be trained. You can't kill this creature. It lives inside of you. It is you. You can't kill it. And what can you do? You train it. In what Ghazali says in, in, in uh, Minhaj Al-Abidin, uh, the way you train it is that you muzzle it first. You must muzzle it. Because it's, it's, it's an animal. The nuts is like a beast. And you train it to work for you. And if you don't train it, then it will create havoc in you. Uh, so it's like a beast, a wild beast. Either you leave it as it is and you uh, let it eat whatever it wants to eat and sleep whenever it wants to sleep and basically become, becomes a monster in you. Right? Then in that case, it will just bring you to destruction. However, if you train this nafs, right, and how do you train this nafs? You train this nafs by first and foremost fixing on it the muzzle of taqwa. Right, you put taqwa over the, 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 the nafs. Right, you fix it in the muzzle of taqwa, and then he says the nafs will still struggle, like, like all animals. You put a muzzle on it, it will still struggle. Right, so what do you do? You starve the nafs. Literally, you start fasting. Right, you actually starve the nafs. And you deprive it of too much sleep. You just cannot sleep all the time. Right? Less sleep. Imam Ghazali says, he's Imam Ghazali, yeah, he says that maximum amount of sleep for a human being, right, is eight hours as a maximum and he says that's a lazy person. And then our, our sign says that's the minimum you, sh- you should have. <laughs> eight hours is yeah, that is luxury. Yeah, that is luxury. That's a lazy yeah, person who sleeps at eight, uh, eight hours of... of <laughs> sleep, <Yeah>. eight hours. <laughs> eight hours of sleep. <laughs> right, he said, uh, you should just have maybe about four hours. And he means he means day and night. Eh? He means counting in the day and the night. So if people sleep in the day, plus their night sleep, he just should be around four to five hours. All together. <laughs> You're like, whoa. If I sleep at ten, <laughs> what time do we wake up? <laughs> right, you must count. Lah. And then in the day, sleep one hour. It doesn't sleep in the day, lah. Eh? It doesn't sleep in the day. Uh, it must count, lah. Like about five hours, you will say. Right? But Mother says, but Mother says, even that is is too much because if you live uh, sixty years on this earth and you spend eight hours a day sleeping, then you have spent one third of your life asleep. It means twenty years of your life you're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> of 60 years. <laughs> and he says, what a waste. <laughs> and he says, what, what a waste. And you're wasting so much time sleeping. And he says, may Allah subhanahu wa wake us up. Subhanallah. And so, Nafsul Muthma'ina is a nafs that is completely in line with the Sharia. Right? It is, it is, it is, and, and you see, when a nafs is in line with the Sharia, only then will this nafs reach tranquility and peace. Only then. Right? Because the Sharia was, was given to us as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us in this world so that we will achieve bliss in this world and the next world. And we believe that. I mean, we do sharia, sharia is just for the, for the benefit of the human being. Anything that uh, deviates from the Sharia will basically deviate from the path of bliss. It will. I mean, sharia is the, is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for us to live in this world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyah like the return to your lord right uh, all please and and the allah subhanahu is pleased with you right the first meaning you mentioned at the point of death this will be said to a righteous person a pious person someone whom allah subhanahu is pleased with when the angels come to this person he will, they will say irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyah Right, they will say to the righteous soul, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hear the angels say that to us, you know, when they come to us, let them say that to us, you know, oh, you know, soul at peace, come back to your Lord, he's returned to your Lord. This so is whenever you go to all the graves of the awliya, you will find this verse there. And the you know, you will find, you know, right in front, on the grave itself, right, there's some ayat there, is this ayat. Right, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki rabbiya mardiya, uh, you actually find it at a lot of the maqams right? because you know this is basically this 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 wali his nafs is a nafs mutmainna right so the first meaning is otherworldly right at the point of death or the next world the second meaning right is that uh this nafs mutmainna whenever it feels any problem in this world and right, the first thing that it will do is it will run right to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right? it does not do anything before calling on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says here, Irji'i fadkhuli fi ibadi. Fadkhuli fi ibadi. So enter from amongst my servants. Uh, again, the two meanings here. Uh, the first meaning is, you know, enter from amongst my servants. It means enter paradise with all of those whom I am pleased with. Of my prophets, of my messengers, of the awliya, of the salihin. I enter paradise and be amongst their, be in their presence. And here we understand that of the highest bliss that a human being can actually ever experience is the companionship of righteous people. And that's the highest bliss. Which is why in paradise, right, the, of the bliss in paradise right, is, is basically your companionship with other people who have made it into paradise. Uh, it will be the most you know, beautiful thing. Because for human beings, without companionship, that is beautiful. Right? You, you, you won't actually reach the highest uh, form of, of happiness. Uh, human beings, you can have everything you want, but if you're having it all alone, there's no happiness in it. When you have things, right, even in this dunya, we know that we have the experience, when you have stuff in this dunya, if you're the only one who's, who actually has it, there's nobody else around you, you won't actually experience happiness. And you're the only one that, for example, you have a TV, you're the only one that you watch. Right? You know, or you have like, you know, food and a lot of you know, nice, or you bake a very nice brownie cake. Right? And you're the only one who eats it. And most people like, you won't feel so happy. I don't know, maybe some people be happy. But most people, you won't, you won't feel so happy. You want to like, call people over, you will try to share, you try to, because there's a happiness. Right? Human beings find happiness right? when they have companionship. Right? So even in their own, uh, whatever they like to do, a lot of human beings, it will not be complete until there is, there is good right, and healthy companionship. So in paradise, many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak about companionship in paradise. Right, so the first meaning is, uh, right, oh, You will enter, you will be, you be united with my servants. The other meaning is, right, in this dunya, in this dunya, this nasr mutma'inna, uh, it will search out the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it will go around searching. And, and when they, they know that the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are present, they will run to be in their presence. Uh, so they know like, you know like a big shay or a habib or whosoever is in town, uh, they will quickly, you know, they want to be in the presence of these people. Uh, because they know these people are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, Wadhuli jannati and enter my paradise. Right? And then, uh, that is the last thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Allah mentions here. Right, so you see the last part of Surah Fajr, it goes from the highest bliss to the lowest bliss. The highest bliss is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your pleasure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second highest bliss is companionship with the righteous. And right, Imam Shafi'i said, if you were not for night prayer, and if you were not for night prayer, and uh, for good companionship, you don't want to stay in this dunya anymore. <laughs> right? It's only because of night prayer, that the sweetness in night prayer, and the sweetness of good companionship. So the, second, the second highest uh, ni'mah here, the second highest bliss here, right, is good companionship. And the last one is paradise itself. 
And so you see, it is it is arranged in uh, in order. Right? It's from the greatest of uh, of delights to the least of delights, and the least of delights is not is not in any way small. Eh? Right? Paradise itself is you know is is a great reward from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And with that, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He ends Surah Fajr. Right? Alhamdulillah, right? in a very beautiful way. Right. So we're going on to the next surah, right? Surah Ghashiyah. Alhamdulillah. Surah A'la So we have Surah Ghosha Surah A'la and Surah Tariq are two short surahs right? And then we will go into the one-page surahs And there's a series of one-page surahs In Juz Amma right? After Surah uh, Tariq right? Surah Buruj, Surah Inshikaq right? And then you have Surah Mutafifin Which is a very long surah right? And then you have Surah uh, Infitar So the next few next few groups of surahs right? uh, the, ne- the next group of surahs After Surah A'la I will all have Pretty much the same theme going on. Right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala begins all of the surahs, right? or most of the surahs, with a scene on the day of judgment. Right? So this surah actually they go right into the day of judgment. Okay, we're going to recite Surah Ghashiyah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Hal ataq hadith al Ghashiyah. وجوه يومئذ خاشعة عاملة ناصبة تصلى نارا حامية تسقى من عين آنية ليس لهم طعام إلا من ضريع لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع وجوه يومئذ ناعمة لسعيها راضية في جنة عانية لا تسمع فيها لغوا ولا ت... لا ت... لا تسأل لا تسمع فيها لا لا تس وسرعه لي لا تسمع فيها لاغية لا غيا لا تس ما أسوأ سرعين لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية فيها سرور مرفوعة وأكواب موضوعة ونمارق مسفوفة وزرابي مبثوثة أفلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء كيف رفعت وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم صدق الله العظيم. Alright, so here Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He begins. هل أتاك حديث الغاشية؟ So Allah begins the surah, surah Ghashiyah, which is a Meccan surah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala begins with a question, and this question is posed to Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Right, so he says, O oh Muhammad, has it come to you? Has it come to you the news of the overwhelming event? So Ghashia, it means an event that will completely surround you, completely envelop you. There is no escape from this event. Right, so the, 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 uh, the best translation will be the overwhelming event. Right, it will overwhelm you. Right, so has it come to you the news of the overwhelming event? So here, you know, in, in, in Arabic, there are two ways of asking a question. You can say hal and you can say ah. Right, ah. So in like for example, when Allah subhanahu wa says in Surah Alam Nashrah, right, Allah says, Alam Nashrah laka sodarak ah. Right, so ah is a question that's a rhetorical question. Right, that means have we not expanded your chest for you? So it's not a question that, that requires an answer, right, but it's, it's more of you know a reminder. Right, you know, we have expanded your chest for you. Right. Uh, but the word questions that begin with hal, right, these questions are actually sincere questions. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he's, he's putting forth a sincere question. Hal ataka hadith al ghashia? I has the news of the overwhelming event come to you? Right? And we know that of course he has come to Rasulullah right? sallallahu He knows about this news of the day of judgment. That's the first thing he's been told. Uh, when, he was, when he was given the, the wahyu, he was already told about the coming of the day of judgment. So you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while addressing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know that he's addressing Rasulullah sallam because he says, Ataka. And whenever there is a singular you in the Quran, I automatically it refers to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It does not talk about anybody else. It refers directly and automatically to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, so does it, has it come to you, O Muhammad? Right, the news of the overwhelming event. So you see, this verse, right, it is addressed to Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam, but it's a very gentle verse. In a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually addressing those who are around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, those of the disbelievers who are around him, but Allah is doing it gently. Right, so Allah, so like for example, you know, like you have a teacher, right, and the teacher says to the best student there, you know, have you done your homework? And the teacher knows that the best student has done his homework, right? But she does that so that the others will hear what she says, right? and they begin to buck up, right? They begin to also, you know, you know, we better, we better do our homework before the teacher asks us about our, our homework, that kind of thing. Right? So instead of she knows that they have not done it. Or she knows that they have, you know, uh, been playing or whatsoever. But just to give a warning without being hard. Right? To give a warning being gentle. Right? He, she directs the question to someone who actually has done it. Right? So when Allah directs the question to Rasulullah has the, the has the news of the overwhelming event come to you? Right? Of course it has come. Right? Of course it has come. But Allah SWT is going gently so that they will listen. And the courage, the, the, the disbelievers, they will listen to what is about to be said. And he says, Wujuhu yawma'idhin khashi'ah amilatun nasibah and On that day, faces and will be full of fear on that day. So see, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with is fear. Right? You mentioned before, whenever the Quran speaks about uh, threats, it will always speak about rewards. Whenever it speaks about fear, it will always speak about hope. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always balance it off. Right? Balances it off. But sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do the hope first and then the fear. Right? Or the reward first and then the punishment. Right? But most times it will be the other way around. It will be punishment first and then the reward. Right? Fear first and then the hope. Right? So you see that subhanahu you know, it's always bad, but Allah will put forth the negative one first. Right? Why? Because human beings are more affected by deterrence than by rewards. Right? And if you have children, you will know this. Right? If, you, if you offer a reward, sometimes they might not do it. Right? You know, sometimes, because it has, to be, it has to be worth it. Right? It has to be worth it. Right? But if there's a threat you know, or a deterrent right, in some way, by a, a privilege is being taken away, right, that, that actually is more effective. And that's where human beings are. And when there are deterrents, when there is a threat, when there is a privilege taken away, whatever, right, that's actually more effective on most human beings right, than actually there being rewards. Right? Especially you know, if you handle older children. Right? Older children, right, sometimes rewards doesn't really bother them. And they're not really interested in rewards. Right? But when you take away privileges, right, then the, they start to pay attention. Lah, right? I mean, there's a threat there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the, the nature of human beings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He begins with the threat. On that day, there will be faces that will be humbled, right? Humbled faces, you know. Aamilatun uh, nasiba. Aamilatun nasiba meaning wasted efforts or wasted deeds. And right? so Allah is giving is giving a warning, right? That you think that you what you're doing is right, what you're doing is good. And look into what you are doing in Surah Kafi. At the end of Surah Kafi, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Say, O Muhammad." Shall I not inform you of the most wasted of deeds? Right? We, by, of the most, you know, uses of deeds. Right? And, then the, uh, then, uh, and then the ayah continues, Those who, who they, 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 they do all these deeds, thinking that they are doing good, but they are not. And because they're not doing it in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to. It means they want to do good, but they don't want to follow the sharia. They want to do it however they want to do it. And even in our time, we have people who like, you know, they will say, oh, I worship God, but I want to worship God my way. 
in wonderful way of Rasulullah so that's how even Muslims will say that you know that, that the Prophet's way is his way of worshipping God and I have my way of worshipping God so therefore I will worship God my way right? of course that way is not accepted right? the only way of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the way that was taught to us by Rasulullah s.a.w. if every person was meant to have his own way of worshipping God then for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets for, for people to follow the prophets and that's why they are there Right, so you know this is all uh, false statements, you know, all, all bad things. Right? It's, it's all it's all false statements. So wujuhu yawma idin khashi ah amila tunasiba. My amila are deeds that are completely wasted. Tasla naran hamia. Allah goes straight into the punishment. Right, they will be roasting right, in a, in a fire. Tuska min ainin ania. Right, and they will drink from a spring that is at its boiling point. Right, and the boiling point in hellfire is not 100 degrees. Eh? <laughs> the boiling point in hellfire is way, way more than, more than that. Right, so they will be roasted in a fire. Right, that is hamia. Hamia, that means it has like, you know, this kind of like flames, you know, or this hot air that just burns your skin off of, the, off of your bones. Right, the hamia is so hot. And that, you know, that your skin, just by the wind from the fire, uh, it gets burnt from the bones. And so, see, Allah subhanahu begins ragashia uh, by a question, and the question is a sincere question, to get the attention of the disbelievers, uh, to listen into the surah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes into uh, the, the punishments first, right? To frighten them, right? And to threaten them so that they will, they will, they will stop the nonsense. Right? And then they will seek reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so tusqa min aynin aniya. Right, aniya from the word al an, and it means now. It right, means from this 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 water or the spring, right? That whereby it is it is at its boiling point. There is a boiling point in the in in the hellfire, and only Allah subhanahu wa knows right, what kind of uh, heat that is. Right, but they be so thirsty in the hellfire. That they will grab the water from this boiling boiling spring and they will gulp it down. Right, and this water will just burn their throats and their insides all the way. But they will keep gulping and gulping and gulping because of their, their extreme thirst in the hellfire. So Allah says, لَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَعَامٌ إِلَّا مِنْ ضُرِيعٌ right, Dhuriyah, right, they have, and they have no food. So the what, what water is for them? The, the water that is for them, it is burning water. Right, and when you look around for food, they cannot find food except for this fruit that is full of thorns. And it's this fruit that has huge thorns coming out from the from this fruit. So they will take this fruit and they will try to eat it. Because there's no food for them in the hellfire. They will find this fruit that's full of thorns and they will try, try to eat it. And every time they eat it, I, they, will, they, they, will be, they will choke from the thorns because it will poke right through their throats. Then they will take the hot boiling water and they will drink the hot boiling water to try and wash it down. Then it will burn the entire of the insides. And so Allah says in the Quran, in the Quran Allah says, Every time, people of the hellfire, every time their flesh burns off, Allah will give them a new flesh. So they will continuously feel the pain in the hellfire. See, whenever Allah subhanahu goes into the chair of the hellfire in the Quran, it's just, it, it's actually very, it's, it's, it's dashat, I would say dashat. <laughs> it's so scary, the hellfire, whenever Allah describes the hellfire in the Quran. But this is what Allah's words. And Allah says what He wants to say. So we shouldn't be, you know, like, so afraid to speak about the hellfire. This is the hellfire. This is what it is. And by the same time, you always pair it up with paradise. Because Allah has, Allah has his, his warning and He has His uh, mercy. And there was once, in a hadith where uh, Rasulullah said that hellfire and paradise were once in an argument. Right? And the hellfire says, you know, I am better because in me is every... Is every uh, arrogant person, you know, a powerful person and tyrant. <laughs> Hellfire says that. And then the paradise says, well, in me, is a hadith eh? in Nur Salihin. The paradise will say, and in me is every weak person and oppressed person and every poor person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, rectifies within them. And Allah says, you, oh my hellfire, you are my rock. I, I, sh- I, 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 will, I will burn whomsoever I want in you. And you, O oh paradise, you are my mercy. I will place whomsoever I want in you. And Allah says, and it's on me to fill up the both of you. And I say, hellfire, may Allah protect from the hellfire. The hellfire is such a, 
you go through the descriptions, you just, you know, your heart, <laughs> like, it's, it's so terrible, the hellfire, that you won't even want it on your worst enemy. You would not want the hellfire on your worst enemy. Right? How horrid the hellfire. And, but we know that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will never be, he will never feel any rest at all in paradise until every single one of his ummah is brought out of the hellfire. And he'll keep asking the angel Malik of the, of the hellfire, is there anyone else? Is there anyone else in the fire? He'll keep coming out of paradise to go to, to, to angel Malik and to ask him, is there anyone else? Anyone else? And every time the angels will just go into the hellfire and they will uh, basically search the hellfire for the signs of sujud. Right, so when they find it, because the, the, the spot of sujud cannot be burnt by the hellfire. If anybody ever sujud before to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, that part has ever done even one sujud, it right, cannot be burnt by the hellfire. Right, you cannot touch it. Right, so, so Malik, right, uh, the angel Malik, right, he will send his own angels into the fire right, to search for people that the mark is still there. Right, and then they will be pulled out of the hellfire, they will be put into the, the, the rivers of paradise and completely clean and they can enter into paradise. So every person eventually, inshallah, who, as long as they die on La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that's the key, eh? they must die on the shahada. They must. Right? As long as they die on the shahada, inshallah, eventually they'll enter into paradise. But you don't, know, you don't want that. You want to enter paradise straight away. Right? Nobody wants to let you know, chill up in the hellfire for a while and come out after that. <laughs> you don't want to go there for even for a moment. You don't want to. You know, just the smell, even the smell of the hellfire, the roar of the hellfire. Right? All of it is terrifying on the human being. You cannot handle it. Right? So at best, ya Allah, don't even, we don't even want to have hisab. We don't even want Allah to ask us questions about what we have done on this earth. Just enter us into paradise. You know, finish the affair. Right? Enter into paradise. Don't, 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 don't seek uh, for, for anything else. So Allah subhanahu says, لَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَعَامٌ إِلَّا مِنْ ضَرِيعٌ Right, doria. It is a uh, food that is food. It is a type of fruit that is full of uh, thorns. And this fruit actually existed in the Arabian Peninsula. It exists. They have a fruit right, in their deserts. It is called doria. Right, doria. It is a fruit that has thorns. Right, and their camels used to eat this fruit. Because you see, if you ever seen camels before, right, they have like very rubbery uh, lips. Right, so they're not affected by thorns. Right, so a lot of lot of desert plants have thorns. Uh, because the, the plant actually needs to protect itself uh, from animals because the water is scarce. Uh, so the, the desert plants tend to have thorns. We have cactus and whatsoever, they have thorns. Right? But the camel is able to eat over that. It's able to chew over that, the camel. So the camel used to, they will see their own camels eating this doria. Right? They, will, they will consume. So, they, so some of the disbelievers say doria. There's something wrong with Dorit, what? Our oh, yeah, camels eat Dorit, what? You know, why, why should we, you know, they're being arrogant. Uh? You know, why should we, we, we be so scared, you know, of, of uh, eating Dorit in, in hellfire? Then Allah subhanahu wa says, La yusminu wa la yughni min Allah says, this Dorit does not fulfill the purpose of food. Because food has two purposes. The first purpose is to nourish you. Right? It's the first to make you, La yusminu means uh, they, don't, they don't get fat. That means they don't, they don't get nourished by this food. Wala yughni min jur, it does not remove the pains of hunger or the pangs of hunger. And so this daria, they will eat a lot of it. And because of the, of the dari, they will, they will drink a lot right, of the boiling water. Right? And because of that, they will uh, continuously torture themselves in the hellfire. This is, this is actually basically on top of their main torture. Right? Everyone in the hellfire will have a main torture. And there will be, be a main thing that will happen to them. Uh, with regards to their sins. So every sin will have their, its own uh, specific uh, punishment. Uh, but the nourishment in the hellfire is this doria and this uh, boiling water. Uh, so they will keep doing it. And also this, this fruit does, it does nothing for you. It will not nourish you, nor will it stop hunger from coming to you. It will not. Uh, they, will, they, will, they will be starving and be eating the fruit. They will be starving and eating the fruit. And you don't know what else to do. And they will be thirsty and they will be drinking the, the boiling water. And you don't know what else to do. Uh, so it's a continuous, uh, terrible situation in uh, the hellfire. Uh, and, and then uh, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He brings the second picture. And He says, يَوْمَئِذٍ وُجُوهُ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاعِمَ لِسَعْيِهَا رَوْضِيَ فِي جَنَّةٍ عَالِيَةٍ Right, so, and then now the second group of people, 
people on that day whereby their faces will be full of bliss right, and reward. Right? Happy faces on that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Radiya, right? this, these people who have such blissful faces on that day, right? they will be content with what they have striven in in the world. And you see this is how this surah is connected to the surah uh, Fajr. Right? In surah Fajr. Right, because Surah Fajr, this is, this is the first group of people whereby their faces are humiliated and humbled. These will be specifically those who were arrogant in the world. Right, those, if there's a hadith, whosoever elevates himself, Allah will debase him. And whoever, debase, whoever brings himself low, right, you know, he humbles himself, Allah will elevate him. Right, so, you, you know, if you want elevation in the next world, then choose uh, humbleness in this world. I choose to be humble in this world. Uh, but if you exert yourself, you, you raise yourself, you, 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 you seek uh, praise and, and uh, all kinds of you know, uh, people, people to hold you up in awe. Uh, if you want all that in this dunya, then the next world, Allah subhanahu wa will give you the opposite of it. Right, so he says here, like, La yusmin, uh, Masjid Muhammad. Right, so this right, nafs to this, this second group of people, Right, the, their faces are shining with, with uh, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ta'at. Right, they will be pleased with their strivings. This sa'iha rodiya fi jannatin aliya. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the rewards for them. As how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the punishment in the hellfire, He mentions the reward in paradise. Okay, I'm just going to do a, a parallel eh? So the first phase, should use the right word, it's okay. Right, the first phase, right, you have wujuhun, wujuhun yawma'idin khashia, fear. Right, it is full of fear on the first phase. The second phase, right, it is na'ima. That means in full bliss. The second phase, there's no fear, nothing on the day of judgment. In fact, the believers on the day of judgment, they will not uh, go through a long waiting. It's going to be a very short waiting and they're going to enter paradise. Right, but with these believers, you can go up to 70,000 years of waiting for their judgment. They'll right, just be waiting under the hot sun, right, naked. Right, and Allah SWT protect us from that. Right, the believers, Allah SWT very fast, He will bring them into paradise. And they can uh, rest in paradise. Right, because you can, you, you can imagine, lah, you, know, like, like, you, know, you have like a very nice hotel room. And you're told to wait in the lobby in a week. And basically, it's, it's, it's just hot. Lah. It's hot there. The day of judgment will be like that. The day of judgment, the, head, the, the sun is said to be a hand span above the head. The sun. Right? And those who are not shielded on the day of judgment, then their brains will be, their brains will be boiling. It means it's really torture on the day of judgment itself. It's like the ulama say, no, you know, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for no reckoning. Because you want to enter into paradise straight away. Right. So he says here, لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية. I saw of the bliss of paradise. The first bliss. I was on comparing the two faces, right? Of the first bliss of paradise is that Allah Subhanahu wa says. He will not hear in paradise any form of vain talk. Right? Vain talk or lewd talk. He will not hear that in paradise at all. Which is an indication that ulama say that vain talk or useless talk or, uh, or lewd talk, these are all forms of punishment. If someone finds himself you know, always uh, obsessing, you know, or loving lewd talk, or they love all kinds of, you know, it, basically, it's not nice talk, right? If you find yourself liking it, uh, or seeking it, or wanting it, and uh, you like people, you know, to use bad words, or profanity, or be crude in their language, or in their, in what they talk about, if you like it, right? Like some people, you know, when you, when you go back to school, I don't know if you all know, uh, but when, when I was in school, right, like teenagers, in JC, in secondary school, they like to speak about dirty things. Right? It's normal school behavior. Right? And sometimes you're wondering, like, why must he talk about these kind of things? Like, why, why is there nothing else for them to talk about? 
Uh, but it's still secondary school. You'll find it. I think now the primary school is that. <laughs> right? Talking about all these kind of things. That's in primary school already. Right? This is, and they begin to enjoy talking about all these kind of you know, really horrible things you talk about. They're very young children talking about these things. Right? These are all signs of punishment. If it's onto an adult, it's a punishment. Right? But of course, children, they don't understand what they're doing. <laughs> right? Maybe they do. Allahu right? right? But they are not held to account. And of course, if they pass a puberty, they're held to account. Right? So if, as an adult, if you love or you desire these kind of things, it's a form of punishment because in paradise, Allah speaks about the absence of it being a form of reward. And the absence you know, of vain talk, this kind of talk, is actually, is actually rewarding. And we know, you know, even in this world, you find peace when the people around you stop talking nonsense. Right? You actually find peace. And in fact, this, this ayat was revealed onto Rasulullah SAW because these believers, they were being very annoying towards Rasulullah SAW, slandering him, uh, cursing, cursing him, insulting him, doing all kinds of terrible speech to Rasulullah SAW. So Allah says to Rasulullah SAW, you know what, in paradise, you will be spared of all their nonsense that you have to endure in this world. Right? So, la, tas, la tasma'u. Right? Tasma'u is a singular you, singular male. Right? That's why the ulama say that it is, it is referring to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fiha la ghiya. Right? He used to hate, Rasulullah sallam, he used to hate it when the disbelievers would, you know, they just talk nonsense in front of him. He doesn't like anything that is frivolous right? or without any benefit. So of the rewards of paradise, you will not hear any more of this crude talk right? or any more of this nonsense. Fiha ainun jariyah, right? In it, it is uh, there is a spring that is continuously flowing, and to the Arabs, this is some a form of, of very high bliss because they are people of uh, they have they always lack water. Fiha sururum marfu'a wa akwabum mawdu'a wa namariku masfufa. Was a you mabsusa. I saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he continues and he explains the different, uh, he explains, he describes the room in which a believer is in. And so, how is his room? Right, first and foremost, he has beds, you know, or mattresses that are elevated and raised. And so, again, these are all forms of luxury right, for the Arabs because. For the most Arabs in the time of Rasulullah Islam, right, they were people who were actually nomads. Right, they were move from place to place. Right, so if you say, oh, to have a bed that is raised, to have you know, a cups out place for you, you know, uh, all, all arranged for you, right, for them it's great luxury. Right, who has a raised bed? For them, they all sit on the floor. And who has a ra- for us, we have all raised beds. Eh? Right, we're all like, nah. <laughs> we're all like the lion, lion shit. <laughs> uh, but for them, it's all on the floor. Everything is on the floor. Right, so who would actually raise their beds? We have raised our beds. Eh? But Allah subhanahu is, is you know, showing us this is one of the delights of paradise. In another surah, Allah subhanahu says that in paradise, right, they will all be reclining on couches, <gasps> facing each other. So we mentioned that in the previous surah about companionship. Right, they all be on raised crouches, they be looking at each other, and they will be talking about the dunya, trying to remember something of it, but they can't remember much of it. Because the dunya will seem to be like a like a bad dream, right, to them the dunya. Right, so when we go, inshallah, when we go to paradise, eh, let's get to paradise first. And when you get to paradise, eh, inshallah, the dunya will seem like a bad dream. That's all it will seem like. Right, all this in Surah Nazian. And right, when they ask about how long is the dunya? They will say half a day or maybe a day. There was a length of a dunya. Only maybe half a day around there. This our entire existence eh, will seem like half a day in the Akhirah. Yeah, half a day. I don't know what I did. Eat, slept, <laughs> prayed a bit here and there. Right? SubhanAllah. Right? On the day of judgment, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put everything in perspective. So that's why the I mean, Rasulullah has many hadiths whereby he speaks against. Seeking or running after wealth in this dunya. The, the entire Quran, you don't even have to go you know, so far. The entire Quran speaks about the, the blameworthiness of human beings in being so obsessed with wealth. And it's going to be the same message over and over again throughout the Quran. Right? It is wealth, it is wealth, it is wealth. You just love your wealth. That's why you're so distracted. And Allah says, 
and aqua are basically uh, fine glasses and right, for drinks right? they're fine glasses and it's all spread out I right? meaning you don't even, you don't even have to go through the the tiredness of pouring yourself a drink <laughs> and Allah is showing even to something so slight like pouring yourself a drink I mean, you're not even given an empty cup with a jug no you're giving everything prepared for you all you have to do is just look at it and there's even a hadith that says that you know that someone in paradise just thinks about something and it's there in front of him so you don't have to ask dua or nothing it just, it just comes to your heart and it goes away it's there in front of you that's it Right, this is the, the bits of paradise. Eh? Like, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked in the paradise. And then he says here, وَزَرَابِيُّ مَبْسُوثَ right, زَرَابِيُّ مَبْسُوثَ uh, Carpets. Right, carpets laid out right, for, uh, for the people and, and for the Arabs. Carpets, right, in that time, lah, eh? uh, some time, carpets, they are, very, they are such great luxury. Carpets. Right, because only the rich had carpets in the time of Rasulullah SAW. So Allah says, you know, no, in this place you have carpets everywhere. Spread out for you. How beautiful the place. Right, so Allah subhanahu wa ends, right, the وَنَمَارِقُ مَسْخُوفَ نَمَارِقُ I missed نَمَارِقُ نَمَارِقُ is basically pillows. Right, pillows, masfufa, right, uh, they are arranged up. Right, so you have your bed, since the, 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 the room of someone on the judgment, uh, the room of someone in paradise. And he has his bed, it's elevated. There are cups lining around you. Whenever you want a drink, the drink comes. And we know that in paradise, right, the, the food in paradise only ever gets better. So if someone uh, eats the food or drinks the food, if he takes another sip, it's better than the first sip. When you take the next sip, it is better than the first sip. Right? And the taste of a drink will linger in the mouth, they say, for like a, a long number of years. I forgot the number is exactly. But for a no, long number of years, the, the sweetness of the food or the drink will linger in the mouth. It means you're constantly tasting it. Like in this dunya, like you like ice cream or chocolate whatsoever, right? You eat it, for like 10 seconds you taste it. And then it goes in. Right? And then eat some more. Lah. <laughs> and we eat some more because tr- we are tr- actually subconsciously, we're trying to prolong that taste. <laughs> it's in the mouth. That's why we eat so much. <laughs> right? Because you know, it's not that you need it. You don't need it. You're not hungry. Uh, but the human being loves that taste, right? So, so we can't we can't seem to to, to keep it, <laughs> right? So because because you can't keep it, you keep renewing it, right? Doing more and more and more. In paradise, you know, one bite of the food in paradise, and there's nothing in this dunya that can compare in any way to what will be given to you in paradise. You take one bite, it will stay in your mouth for they say how many thousands of years? It will stay in your mouth. Right, so subhanAllah, you know, subhanAllah, let us reach paradise. You know, and these are all the minimum, the minimal rewards of paradise. This is really the lowest, lowest, lowest level in paradise. And right? in paradise, there are much higher levels. That's not about this. Right, something that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows. Right. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, He stops uh, the first part of Surah Ghashiyah. So the first passage of Gosha, it ends with, it, it speaks about uh, the punishment of those who, are in, who enter the hellfire, and it speaks about the reward of those who are in paradise. Okay, thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes into a few verses of uh, contemplation and pondering. And we have mentioned before, right, why the Quran goes into contemplation, why it goes into pondering. Right, because it makes a human being think and look around him. Because a, the person who ponders or contemplates will be more firm on the truth. And the reason why people are shaky in their iman is because they never take time to actually ponder over what they really believe. If a person was to think about what they really believe, for example, you believe in the next world, a lot of issues in your life will be rectified. By your belief in the next world, because whatever you have is that is that is that's wrong in this world, you place it next to the deal in in the hereafter paradise, right? And and all that comes with it, then whatever dunyawi problem you have seems very insignificant. It's not it's not a big issue, and you're able to like you know what? I always do to Allah subhanahu wa taala just handle it, right? In a way, and Allah subhanahu wa taala handle it, right? So so Allah subhanahu wa taala goes into a lot of pondering in the Quran, and here you come to a few verses. And whereby Allah calls us to ponder over certain parts of His creation. 
Allah speaks about the camel, then he speaks about the sky, right? then he speaks about the mountain, then he speaks about the earth. Right? And we're going to see why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right, go in this order. Right? The camel, the sky, uh, the, the, the mountain and the earth. Right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends surah, surah Ghashia right, by just saying to Rasulullah that your only role here is to remind them. That's all. Your only role here is to remind them, to inform them and so don't beat yourself up about it. So inshallah, uh, I think the next time round we will take this part lah. Eh? We will take this part in the next time round, uh, so that we can inshallah finish it, finish the surah next lesson inshallah. Are there any questions? Yeah, just about mm. just one sort of discussion. Um, say you have like very limited time during the tahajjud. Okay. Is it two more prayers with the Quran or two? Okay. The the ulama they do actually discuss this. They say, which ever of the three that affects your heart the most. Mm. So the answer is not one answer. It depends on you. It depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> because the whole point of the Hajj is to bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the, the question was actually, uh, should I do uh, long standings? Yeah. Uh, or with a lot of Quran and, or long sujuds, a lot of du'as? Or should I do a lot of rakats? <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's right. So, uh, the whole point is for you to have your private moment for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. However, that is best for you. For uh, to lie around, lie lah. Different people they have different ways of reaching to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, tahajjud is not a matter of you know like track record, trying to you know gain like hundred rakaat kapu. <laughs> You're not trying to you know uh, score. <laughs> Sounds like score. The whole point is to get close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That's the point. Right? And however that is, like Ibn Shafi, he might take one ayat in the Hajj, just one ayat of the Quran, and the whole night he's on that one ayat. Whole night. Tak, tak gerak. <laughs> right? Because he's tasting it. And he's, he's getting all the knowledge from that one ayat. Semua tengah keluar. Right? Oh, Ibn Shafi. And he will not do any rakats. Just that. <laughs> right? So, so line is really, you know, whatever is your, whatever is your taste. In that, and that's that's the point of the hajjud lah. And then there's uh, this, uh, you know, the salat salat salat. You see that actually Rasulullah never did uh, salat hajjud. There's one incident that he was asked to by somebody to to pray at the person's house, and there's no way he was praying. So some people are assuming that that's a bad hajjud. But mm. that's another. So Allah Alam. I mean, there are there are hadiths that say that whenever Rasulullah Sallam was in need. Immediately he will run to the prayer mat and he will pray. Right? So these are the hadiths that they do show that it's like hajat lah. Right? So before like any of the wars, they will find him in prayer, right? in prayer and in desperate du'a to Allah subhanahu wa taala. In some all the other, their proofs lah for salat hajat. And they're like inshallah. Right? And basically, when it comes to uh, ibadah, if there is a basis in the religion, it is allowed. For example, the one, the one if there's a basis, the yeah. So if prayer there's a basis. Dua as a basis, so you put them together, <laughs> you pray and dua, right, in, in a way, right. Okay, uh, any other questions? No? Okay, alhamdulillah. I, I do have, a, but I think it's a... You do have? <laughs> okay, just to let you, uh, the breaks are not coming, but uh, uh, you know Surah Ma'ida? Surah Ma'ida, Ma'ida na. The first few ayats, you will realize that they, they say that uh, Christians and uh, Jews can marry Muslims. And I read the interpretation, interpretation also, it, it says that also. And then uh, there is this... Uh, I follow somebody on Twitter, he is um, from Canada, he's a lama from Canada. He also once uh, answered the question say that yes, Christians can marry Muslims. I'm not saying that it is, yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah. I need an explanation of that. So yeah, okay. yeah. The, the, the one is uh, the Ahlul Kitab. The yeah, Ahlul yes. Kitab. Ah, ah, that's that's why. Why. He didn't even say Ahlul yeah, Kitab. No, he Ahlul said Kitab. We, we can marry. It's Ahlul Kitab. The specific uh, answer is, because the Quran says Ahlul Kitab. So that means the these Christians and these Jews, right? They are people who hold on to their book. Yeah, yeah, that, that, uh, well, they have to be holding on to their book, right? So it, and it's only that uh, the man is Muslim, and the woman is not. Ah yes. Okay. Uh, okay. And the whole point is that and, and also it also comes under a lot of conditions. The Sharia, to marry a Yukita, like it has to come under the condition that you don't have the means to marry a Muslim woman. Yeah, yeah, yes. 
Uh, uh, there's uh, other, other conditions are uh, a lot of conditions before you can actually marry an ahli kitab. Banyak conditions, right? So eventually, I mean, if people today they they, they fulfill all the conditions, kan? It's very hard, very hard. Yeah, he must because there is a lot of conditions. Yeah. If you ask an ulama, so called, I mean, I don't know, ulama yeah, yeah, I know it from there, Middle uh, East, you know, yeah. Dubai, yeah, yeah, Bahrain, yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody yeah, say they can that. marry Ahlul Kitab. But we, who Kitab, are the Ahlul Kitab? Kitab in <laughs> sight of the world, we don't approve of it anyway, because to us they don't exist anymore. Yeah. Yes. So we don't even bother. Mm. You know what I mean? Because we don't have to cross that line. Yeah, that we don't have to do that. Because yeah, I have yeah, read this. Yeah. I have read this in, mm-hmm. when I was in Dubai. People keep on send, um, writing to the newspapers and all that, asking all this, you know? And the same reply coming from them because they believe it is right, it is okay. But we are here in Southeast Asia. Kita punya, like, apa, uh, our custom, our culture here. Kita follow what we have already been set up, so we never accept it. Right. So mm. basically, you do your, you know, you do what you think you, you know, you yeah. have been doing. I will never accept <laughs> it. Basically, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, because I have seen when I was living in Dubai, there are so many of them, but do they really know what they are doing? And if, if according to you, they have to, they can only marry if they cannot find. And there are so many. Muslim women, <laughs> yeah. so where is where does that you know base? They they say they cannot afford Muslim they women. They cannot afford. <laughs> there are so many Muslim women around, you know, in, yeah. in Dubai, in Jeddah, in, but they choose to marry a, a non-Muslim. Yeah, you know because they are in love. That's all. <laughs> That's all. I was saying, yeah, you know, like, you know, it's, it's, cool. not, it's a choice. <laughs> uh, so this is the choice they make. Uh, yeah, la. But, you know, but, uh, that's I mean, a lot. I've seen, yeah. seen so many. But the other thing is, they have they can marry, but the children must always must go according to Islam, Islam faith. Yeah. But can you guarantee? I tell you, you cannot guarantee because I've seen them. I've seen them in action. That the wife takes the children away and make them what she wants. Yeah la, fitna, it's the fitna. So, so many. Yeah la. So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to... It's not a sharia to play with la. Especially when it comes in our time whereby you want to find a woman who can bring up your children well. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Uh, Allah ala. In case. صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة أن الله يرزقنا إما نافع ما نخلص بسوء التعليم والدلالة على الهدى ويصور بقبل النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم وإلى أرواح معالمين ومشايخنا وذا بالحقوق علينا وإلى حضرة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة